Hello, and welcome to our new Patron education modules created in support for the Patron Perfectionist Competition. Across this new look program, we'll offer unmissable insights from expert contributors sharing their knowledge and passion on a wide variety of trend leading subjects. Our aim across these seminars is to empower all of you, a new generation of passion, passionate, inventive and knowledge hungry bartenders, with the most inspiring, rewarding and well rounded training possible. So that you can go back to your bars and start work on the next Patron Tequila Classic Cocktail. Our first module, Discovering Deliciousness, dwells into Mexico's incredible diversity of ingredients and rich culinary culture, as well as advice on finding and using the special ingredients close to where you live. We'll even reveal a new resource we've created to bring our global drink community closer to the incredible ingredients Mexico has to offer. Listo looks to the exciting future of experiential cocktail garnishes, how to awaken your guests' senses and build a unique Patron drinking experience in your bar. Now on to today's session, Mastering the Elements. We'll cover how to think creatively about the flavor when building your next Patron cocktail. My name is TJ Vong. I am the Patron Ambassador for Colorado. It is my pleasure to present to you a unique education revolving around ingredients and cocktail preparation to utilize your creativity in a potentially a new way. I've competed in Perfectionist twice so far, once in 2018 and once in 2019. And at this time, it was the first time that the co cocktail competition was launched in the United States and it was divided into three different regions, East, Central, and West. In 2018, I traveled to Las Vegas to compete with my cocktail, The Lucid Dream, an interactive cocktail designed to feel dreamlike, utilizing Patron, Silver, Tricol, cacao juice, dragon fruit, lime, and jasmine. It was garnished with a rock candy shell designed to be broken into to reach your cocktail. From Vegas, I was able to go to global finals at the Patron Hacienda where I competed against 19 other competitors in 17 other countries for the global title. It was an absolutely magical experience when, where ultimately many of us were classified as top 20 in the world. Even though I didn't take the title, I was able to connect and network with inspiring people from all over the world. Many I still stay in contact with today. Like any competition, the competitors are fierce, talented, and innovative, but I'm here to provide you with as much detail and knowledge as possible to prepare you for the moments to come. So let's get started. So to the mastering the elements, what is your favorite cocktail? It's a question your guests will have asked you hundreds of times over the course of your career. Whatever your answer is, I'm going to guess it'll be a classic recipe that you can order almost anywhere. Satisfying simple serves, often made up to, of three or four elements, these classic drinks are prized by bartenders for their clarity of flavor. This doesn't necessarily mean that the more complex signature drinks you create for your bar's menus will lack clarity of flavor, but whether they do or not is often down to the decision you make while preparing and processing ingredients. Bartenders today have never had so much access to the techniques and technology of flavor. Indeed, at the upper end of our industry, bars prep spaces are beginning to look less like kitchens and more like scenic or science labs. The scale and complexity of their work sometimes requiring the attention of full-time members of staff. More humble techniques for extracting flavor are also being rediscovered. With the pressure of some bartenders prep time requiring them to do not only work towards quality but also efficiency the bounty of possibility can sometimes feel a little intimidating once you found an amazing natural ingredient to put into a cocktail how do you know how to process it to unlock the flavors you're looking for it's possible to process a single ingredient into two different ways and get two totally different flavors frustratingly it's also possible to pick up the wrong process and ruin an ingredient entirely True mastery of the element of flavors of cocktails comes with experience, but through the session we'll share today, we'll set you up with a head start. Originally from Naples, Italy, Giulia Cucurullo originally trained as an architect before choosing the bar as her main creative outlet. Following her passion first to London, then to Paris, she returned to the English capital in 2018 joining the team at the legendary Artisan Bar. After carrying off the Patron Perfections global title, in 2020, Julia now leads Artisan as its head bartender. And since starting in the drinks industry a decade ago, Roxanne Rock has accumulated a wealth of experience on either side of the bar. 
After a period of living in Oman, she returned to her native South Africa, a stint in that country's vivid wine trade leading to her current role representing the Bacardi portfolio, which includes Patron Tequila, as a national brand ambassador. To understand the context in which we're working today, let's start off by looking at how bartenders have harnessed flavor to the craft of their own ingredients throughout history. Welcome to a brief history of the prep shift. While not specifically a product of bartenders, Hippocris is among the earliest examples of the infusion in action. Popular across the Roman Empire, herbs and spices like ginger, grains of paradise, and long pepper were allowed to rest in wine, the resulting infusion being strained through Hippocrates' sleeve and sweetened with honey. It's a process first recorded in the 12th century, but should all sound all too familiar to all of you. Let's dive a little deeper into the history of the prep shift, the dawn of the cocktail. As our focus today is on extracting flavor and using it in cocktails, this is where we'll start. The drinks of this era were so simple, as the author David Wondrich revealed in his book, Imbibe, early punches for one contain little more than spirit, spices, and a lump of unrefined sugar. While addition of spices quickly evolved to the use of bitters, the primary fo focus of these cocktails were made purely to render rough spirits palatable. As we progress to the Jerry Thomas's Bartender's Guide, the father of American mixology, first book, the first book to catalog the massive leap forward in understanding flavor taken by bartenders during the 19th century. Aside from its innovative cocktail recipes, which debuted techniques like milk clarification, flavored ice, and flambéing of spirits, the guide's appendix is a treasure trove of technical prep instruction. One highlight sees Thomas explain how to make 10 different types of plain syrup, uh, sugar syrup, to the progression of the soda fountain, originally imagined as mechanisms that could turn a pharmacy into a social space capable of stealing trade from local bars. American soda fountains and the soda jerks who manned them were a crucial alternative source of beverage flavor innovation in the early 20th century. Taking full advantage of their pharmacist's inventory, their house drinks were bolstered by acids, fruit concentrates, minerals, and essential oils rather than the natural ingredients of old. This guided us into the dark ages. This retreat from the natural and embrace of heavily processed off-the-shelf ingredients reached its global zenith in the 1980s and 90s when a bartender could expect the prep task to include little more than thinly slicing a lemon and refilling a sour mix gun. Eventually we made it to the modern age or the modern era following the global rediscovery of the joy of simple classic cocktails prepared with fresh citrus juice at the start of the 21st century. A generation of bartenders increasingly influenced by the thinking of modernist chefs became keen to the, taking the process of natural ingredients further. Increased ingredient availability combined with funding for equipment that was previously the preserve, uh, preserve for scientists led to the prolifer proliferation of the bar lab. So now that we've understood a little bit of how bartenders ingredient prep has evolved to the ages, we're going to turn our focus to the techniques themselves. Julia shared some advice on approaching the ingredient prep phase of a new drink. Before you start any ingredient prep, think clearly about the final drink. Key flavors, supporting flavors, the drink style and dynamics. If you don't have a clear end goal, you're going to waste a lot of time and effort and product. The next time you create a drink, try asking yourself these four questions before any ingredients are processed. What do I want the key flavor of my drink to be? This flavor is going to be the one that catches your guest's eye and prompts an order. So make sure this flavor is big, bold, and unsubtle, enough to leave an impression. As Julia told us, if I order a drink for one particular flavor that's caught my eye, there's nothing more upsetting than not being able to find it in the drink. If it's there, but there's too much other stuff piled on top, then why bother? As we're focusing here on flavor rather than ingredients, think for a second about the distinction about that distinction. A thoughtful bartender reaches for the bottle of Patron Silver not because they want their drink's key flavor to be tequila, but instead for its earthiness, grassiness, bright citrus, or even pepper notes. One ingredient can contain a multitude of flavors. What do I want the supporting flavors of my drink to be? These will be chosen to either complement or contrast with the key flavor you've chosen. Again, try to think in the terms of flavor rather than ingredients. You might want 
to complement those citrus tones in Patron Silver with red fruit flavor. But the red fruit tones in Ethiopian coffee might harmonize better than actual red fruit. Once you've gathered a selection of the ingredients you think are going to deliver the flavors you need, try this little exercise. Take the ingredient that you'd like to provide your drink's key flavor in your left hand and place it just underneath your left nostril. Take one of the ingredients you'd like to use as a secondary flavor in your right hand and put it a foot or so away from the right nostril. Close your eyes and slowly move your right hand towards your right nostril, smelling gently. Notice how the aromas combine and balance against each other. If they feel balanced when they're both directly under your nose, that's a good sign you'll need to use roughly equal amounts of them in your cocktail. If one aroma hugely overpowers the other, think about how that might influence how you use it in the final drink. You might consider using the weaker element as a tall drink's lengthener, for example, or a t to tame a potent element by infusing it into a tincture that's only added to the drink in tiny dashes. This is by no means a scientific technique, but it is a brilliant way to get an idea of the relative potencies of the flavors you'll be working with and how you might process them. What style of drink will I be making? For many bartenders, this decision is the first one they'll take when creating a new drink. However, when building drinks flavor first, think about moving it later into your creative process. You don't want to paint yourself into a corner. Obsessing over creating a short, stirred down serve, for instance, when many of the flavors you're keen on are best expressed in delicate, voluminous infusions, Consider again whether you're keen to complement or contr contrast the flavors you've settled on through your choice of drink style. A fresh juice sour might feel like the natural expression for the citrus and red fruit combo mentioned earlier, but is adding citrus to citrus really building flavor? Preserving clarity in a bright twist on an old fashioned might yield better results. What dynamics will I need in my drink? This final question is also the simplest answer. By this stage, you know your palette of flavors or what your palette of flavors is, and you'll have an idea of ingredients you need to process to extract those flavors. You also know that the likely ratio of those flavors that will create a balanced drink, as well as the style of serve you'd like to produce. Now we decide on the dynamics. The sour, sweet, bitter, salty, or umami elements that define a cocktail's taste. Roxanne has shared her thoughts. It's obvious when a bartender has really thought about balancing taste and flavor separately in a drink, because with every sip, you're picking up something new. Every taste bud is being activated, but you can also pick up a different kind of balance on the nose. Julia has also offered us some insight onto adding powdered acids to cocktail elements. It's rare for anyone to question whether they're using the right powdered acid or not asking why am I using malic acid instead of citric or tartaric or a blend? How is it interacting with the other ingredients? When I made my rhubarb cordial for my Patron Perfection's entry in 2019, I tried five different versions, each with subtly different ratios of acidity before settling on the perfect blend. Julia's quote shows the importance of not rushing this phase, particularly when working with an ingredient like rhubarb that has its own acidity to factor in. Indeed, many of the ingredients you'll have in mind uh, in your cocktail will contain dynamic elements as part of their makeup, but it's likely they'll need to be tweaking or you'll be need needing to tweak in the final serve. You might have chosen to use a forest honey for its rich, malty, floral flavor, but it also contains a sweetness you'll need to counteract without throwing off the balance of, the of flavor you've carefully assembled. We've included on screen some ingredients you can add at this stage to subtly tweak your cocktail's dynamics. Now we know what our end goal is, we can head, now that we know what our end goal is, we can head to, for the prep kitchen to start unlocking flavor. Let's take a moment to explain our methodology. The majority of the flavors you'll be working or looking to unlock through the different prep techniques will disc the majority of the flavors you'll be looking to unlock through the different prep techniques we'll be discussing today will be found in natural ingredients that fit in one of these categories. Most of the prep techniques you'll use in your bars to harness flavor will also likely fit into one of these categories. 
With the help of our expert contributors, we'll arrange the ingredients by how useful you should find each technique in bringing out certain elements of their flavor. We begin with juicing and blending, two of the most common place prep techniques. It's little wonder they're, they're useful in processing so many types of ingredients. We even use them at Patron, juicing most of from our cooked agaves by crushing them under heavy Tohono stones. But more on that later. While juicing seems like a simple task, there are still a few factors that affect the flavor of your processed ingredient. Citrus juice from an elbow stall, hand squeezer, or cold pressed juice tastes enormously different to that from, uh, to that from a rotary juicer. When using this juicing method, much of the oil that it's squeezed out of the citrus skin washes into the juice, leaving it bursting with notes of perfumed, spices, pine resin, and warm florals. If there, these aren't the flavors that you're looking for, juice with the rotary juicer. The choice of juicer also comes into play when working with berries and more subtle tropical fruits like mango and papaya. When cold pressed, the juice of these fruits contains an unmistakable floral character rose and violet and berries, orange blossom or jasmine and tropical fruits. More aggressive centrifugal style juicers or blenders often generate a considerable amount of heat when operating, sufficient to lend berry or tropical juices a jammy cooked fruit flavor and to remove their delicate floral notes altogether. Unsurprisingly, juice isn't super useful for drying flavor from drier ingredients, but blending can be a brilliant way to extract flavors from nuts and seeds into liquid. Try making a milk by adding your nut or seed of choice to a blender along with water in a 1 to 8 ratio. Blend the two until smooth and then strain away the solids. You'll be left with an unmis unmistakably creamy liquid due to the emulsion of these ingredients' fatty oils. The second prep shift we're putting under the microscope is toasting and roasting. Whether your ingredient is in a pan or on an induction burner, in an oven or even over an open flame, the flavor teased out of it by toasting or roasting is a result of the Malliard reaction. Also known as the browning reaction, you're witnessing this irreversible chemical change whenever you watch bread bake, coffee beans roast, or meat sear. The reaction occurring when amino acids and sugars are introduced to direct heat. It's no coincidence that the ingredients rich in both are those we find most useful to the toast and roast. The flavor transformation of nuts and seeds in the presence of heat is incredible. While unroasted almonds, hazelnuts, and walnuts offer a slight woody creaminess and not much else, roasting reveals tones of dried fruit, smoke, and sulfur. Perhaps it's easier just to say roasting nuts makes them nuttier. Sesame seed, in particular, totally changes its profile when toasted, taking on a darker, malty character and pronounced sulfurness. The second prep technique we're putting under the microscope is toasting and roasting. The Malliard reaction also occurs in fats, most famously in burned butter. When carefully heated in a deep pan, butter's creamy character darkens to take on a wealth of nutty notes. The sheer amount of sugar contained in the flesh of tropical fruits makes them a great candidate for roasting. Think about the flavors in ripe, raw pineapple, esters, vanilla, clove, rum, and white flowers. Roasting pineapple covers all of them in an overwhelming caramel note. Julia told us that when encountering a new ingredient, a cold infusion in water, like light table wine or spirit, has, is usually her first step to get a pure print of its flavors. Generally involving a maceration at room or below room temperature, cold infusion is a brilliant way to extract delicate, subtle flavors that are suggestive of freshness. Bear in mind the ABV of liquid you're infusing with into or uh, may affect the final product. Lower ABV or non-alcoholic ingredients infuse slowly, extracting lighter flavors first, while high ABV ingredients with greater solvent content pull out robust tones more quickly. Fresh flowers have always been fiendishly difficult to work with in a bar due to fragility in both their form and flavor. Capturing flavor from a flower's petals must be done quickly to avoid decay and away from heat, which destroys subtle top notes. When working with fresh petals, try infusing lots of them into a small amount of high proof spirit for just a couple of hours, tasting whenever you can. At the slightest sign of the develop development of vegetal notes or off notes, strain the liquid. The flavor you're able to capture from fresh herbs is also dependent on their exposure to heat. 
when cold infused, whole coriander leaves, breezy citrus notes, and green waxiness are a delight. When it's torn, a mineral note joins courtesy of the chlorophyll escaping the leaf's interior. When it's warmed, it tastes absolutely like nothing. Cold infusion of tea draws out notably different flavors to hot brewing, while its long extraction time allows you to be much more accurate in identifying when the note you're looking for has developed. Unfermented green teas work best as cold infusions, their lack of tannins allowing notes of grass and warm hay to come through. Even if you've never worked a prep shift in your life, if you start your day with a cup of tea or coffee, you're familiar with the principle of hot infusion. An ingredient, usually dry or solid, is steeped, simmered, or cooked until it surrenders its aromatic properties to the liquid that surrounds it. This is a technique that's beloved by bartenders because it's very quick. The extractive power of heat speeding up the infusion process will, while sacrificing a little nuance in final flavor. As, mu uh, as such, it works best when grabbing flavor from drier, heartier produce. Hot infusion is excellent; is an excellent option for robust stone fruits like apricots, cherries, or plums. Generally, fruits regarded as more indulgent than refreshing. Their flavors really lend themselves to being stewed. It develops a satisfying, dense, herbal, leathery note when cooked, particularly in the presence of sugar. Their defining flavor, and the one that's resistant to high heat, is the flavor of almond, or also known as uh, benzalidehyde. benzalidehyde. Starchy vegetables like sweet potato or beetroot also deliver their finest flavor via very hot infusions, usually because they actually require cooking to release their signature sweet earthiness. Julia sounded a, a very personal note of caution when it came to using mint as part of hot infusion. I'm obsessed with how many different flavors you can get out of mint, torn fresh over a falafel. I love it. In a mint tea, not my favorite. The darker toned, slightly balsamic notes mint shows off after hot infusion are certainly loved by many. But if Julia ends up judging one of your Patron perfectionist challenges, you might want to remember her preference. A tinny. A technique and technology that's only come to prominence in the bar world in the past five years or so. Ultrasonic infusion uses a device called a sonicator to push high frequency sound waves through a liquid, agitating the particles therein. As a speedy, high intensity infusion method that also doesn't apply heat to either liquid or infusing ingredient. It's incredibly versatile. Offering all the benefits of a cold infusion in a fraction of the time, ultrasonic infusion is the perfect is perfect for extracting fresh notes from green herbs and delicate perfumes like flowers. Think twice about using it with fermented black teas, however. The assertiveness of the infusion makes it all too easy to extract the astringent and phenolic notes in an accidental overbrew. It's useful in preserving clarity of flavor from fragile ingredients aside. Ultrasonic infusion also boasts a secondary function, the instant creation of stable emulsions. Oils and fats can be blended with water or spirits in moments, eliminating the need for fat washing. For those of you whose curiosity about the ultrasonic infusion has been piqued, but are worried it's technology beyond the means of your bar, don't worry, I have some brilliant news coming for you later. Referring here to lactic or acetic fermentation, aimed at creating and building flavor, rather than alcohol. In fact, so varied our fermentation's effects on the flavor of ingredients, we've, we probably could have hosted an entire session on it. Laws governing the sale of house fermented products vary hugely depending on where you are in the world, so be sure to check your per permitted to do so before getting started. Stone fruit flavors transform during lactic acid fermentation, with peaches and plums developing a headier, almost tropical fruitiness, as well as a complex umami. The almond flavor that's presented in stone fruit also pairs wonderfully with a milk or buttery character that develops as fermentation converts their sugars to lactic acid. Pineapples are actually capable of fermenting spont uh, spontaneously in your fruit bowl, so sugary is their flesh that the wild yeast floating around your bar can begin converting pineapple's greener vegetal notes into a yeasty, boozy flavor you'll recognize if you've ever had or if you've ever made 
tapache. It's suggestive of fresh bread or even cologne. This process actually has an agave equivalent, pulque, an ancient drink based on ambient fermented agave sap and is still popular today in rural Mexico. Me Mexico. Kefir is a simple fermentation of dairy or nut milk that's useful for creating an ingredient that contains both richness and sourness at the same time. Try cold infusing your milk with stone fruits or spices before fermentation, and the process will evolve their flavors too. Two techniques beloved by bartenders for their ability to change a drink's look or texture, as well as its flavor. Fat washing and clarification applications are actually quite limited. We're discussing them today in terms of how they make specific flavors more accessible to you. A technique nearing its 15th anniversary, the fat washing of spirits is now a mainstay of bar prep all over the world. First made famous by bartenders working butter, olive oil, or even animal fats in their cocktails, the proliferation of easily available alternative oils has opened up new possibilities. Try washing Patron, Reposado, and extra virgin avocado oil. The earthy agave and warm oak notes pair incredibly with the oil's subtle mushroom and nut flavors. Fat washing also allows you to build volatile notes from flowers, teas, and herbs into spirits via an ancient perfumer's technique called enflorage. In enflorage, an oil is used to capture the essence of another ingredient. The fact that the oil functions as a barrier to oxygen means that the other ingredients doesn't spoil as quickly, meaning it's particularly useful when working with fresh petals. Try using enflorage to capture the penetrating musk of rose petals and extra virgin olive oil before using it to wash Patron Silver, a perfect partner for both ingredients. Note clarification of liquid ingredients or whole cocktails has an even longer history. The recipes dating back to the 19th century using milk to render opaque liquids. Clear never loses its novelty, but the process also leaves a legacy on a cocktail's flavor. Fatty acids and milk neutralize bitterness. Try milk washing a bitter aperitif style cocktail like a Rosita to see how flavors change. The final process we'll be focusing on is distillation. Distillation can either occur at low temperatures using a rotary evaporator or high temperatures using more of a rustic tabletop still. For reasons of safety, we advise against distilling any liquids other than water or spirit in a rotovap and any liquids that aren't water in a tabletop still. Regulations governing the compounding of alcohol differ according to region, so ensure you're properly licensed to create and then sell these ingredients in your cocktails. Ensure that those who are Acquiring and utilizing the equipment and outfits are working within the regulation of alcohol licensing and government bodies or guidelines. Rotovaps are exceptionally good at capturing high, hyper specific flavor notes from ingredients because their distillation runs can be cut, for instance. A distillation of a vanilla pot infused spirit displays distinct notes of white flowers and grass were you to stop the machine and collect the liquid in the first few minutes. The middle section of the run exhibits the flavor of clove, while the final drops are incredibly dry and woody, tasting remarkably of tobacco. Hydrosols are distillations of infused water and are great fun to prepare in a tabletop still. Because these stills require direct heat, they're not an option for extracting fresher flavor from herbs, flowers, or teas, but they do come into their own when used with citrus peels and dry spices, take a hydrosol made from mandarin peel, for instance. Not only is the resulting liquid drenched in the fruit's signature herbaceous notes, the heat in the still begins brings about a malleard reaction in the peel's oil during the distillation, lending the second half of the run an incredible candied fruit character. If you're thinking of investing in a rotovat for your bar, Julia offered this advice. Buy the biggest distilling flask you can afford. If your flask is twice the size, your prep shift takes half the time. Julia has created a new Patron cocktail that shows off three distinct sides of one of her favorite ingredients, fig leaves. By using a three day cold infusion of whole fig leaves into water, she was able to extract the brightest, most delicate perfume notes 
adding sugar and acids to this resulting liquid to make a cordial. Knowing there's a natural kinship between Patron Silver, Fig Leaf, and Olive Oil, Julia mixed the three and allowed a brisk five-hour infusion, which she then left in a freezer overnight to separate. Once strained, this fat-washed Patron Silver had extracted a sweet honey note from the fig leaves and a savory depth and silky texture from the oil. Finally, Julia blended the fig leaves with a neutral spirit and distilled it in a rotovap at just 20 degrees Celsius. This allowed her to isolate the fig leaves Penet penetrating grassy and green notes, which she filled into an atomizer and spritzed over the drink's surface as an aromatic garnish. We're going to round off this section with some thoughts from our contributors on how all this detail behind the scenes work ultimately intersects with the bar's patrons. Like all of us, Roxanne's got some spots on her resume she's less proud of other uh, uh, Less proud of than others, less proud of than others. But this lovely quote demonstrates that even when working in a more modest environment, her focus was on her guests. A less discussed aspect of bars with a heavy emphasis, emphasis on prep is how the methods they use impact nightly service. At Julia's bar, Artisan, Speedy service is maintained even when the bar is incredibly busy. The fact that the hard work of building flavor into a cocktail has happened days prior rather than at the last minute means that their guest receives their drinks in moments. So we've learned that a single ingredient can offer a spectrum of different flavors, depending on how and what part of the ingredient is processed. How far can we take this knowledge? Could it perhaps be possible to create a cocktail based on only a single thoughtfully processed element? Let's consider the orange. Imagine our task was to create the ultimate orange liqueur to use in a classic Patron margarita. The peel, pith, juice, leaves, and branch of a navel orange were all we have to work with. By now, you should be well versed in the prep techniques you might employ to extract these flavors from the different parts of an orange. Want the best chance at liberating that floral top note locked into a peel? Try vacuum distillation or cold infusion into spirit. After the pedigree heart note from the leaf, a short hot infusion into water will grab it until it smokes. Oops. A short hot infusion into water will grab it for you. Perhaps you'd like a darker accent courtesy of the fruit's branch. Toast the wood until it smokes, chop it into pieces and sap it with a sonicator for just a few minutes. Balance these flavors against each other, adjust the dynamic elements of your liqueurs, and taste the marvel at how clever you are. So we've discussed how the choices you make as a bartenders build flavor in your Patron cocktails, but how do the choices we make in how we produce Patron build flavor into our liquid? As you'll have found out, in our Discovering Delicious module, the flavor of Patron begins in agave fields, where our time-honored relationships with agave-growing families ensures we've always got the best quality crop to work with. Hemidors prep the agaves out in the field by expertly slicing off their spiky pencas. These hardy leaves needn't go to waste. They're commonly woven into mats or rugs. Back at the Hacienda Patron, the agaves are sliced evenly and the coyos removed. This leafy mass at the center of the plant's head can cause bitterness if left attached. Unlike grapes or other fruits, agave doesn't, does not have readily available fermentable sugars. Agave sweetness is locked up in long chain of polysaccharides called fructans, or fructans which need to undergo hydrolysis to convert, a simple ferment, uh, to, convert to simple fermentable sugars. The simplest way of achieving this conversion is by cooking the agave, which at Patron we do in steam-powered brick ovens. We stack the agave piñas in these traditional ovens and cook them in alternating periods of heat and rest for 48 to 72 hours. Using this process, we're able to maintain an incredible clarity and complexity of the agave flavor that we'd struggle to capture if we used more industrial conversion methods. Once these roasted agaves roll out of the oven, we're, we set about shredding them and extracting their juice. 
Remember how I mentioned that the Tahona stone, uh, when we were discussing juicing and blending earlier, these volcanic stone wheels have had a role to play in agave spirit production for over 400 years. Patron is proud to be one of only seven producers still keeping this ancient tradition alive and prouder still to be the largest global producer of Tahona milled tequila, courtesy of our 16 Tahona wheels that run around the clock. Producing a mosto or juice that is consistent, uh, er, that it's in consistent contact with its bagazo, agave fibers. It's said Tahona milling produces notes of earthiness and tropical fruit in the resultant spirit. At Patron, we produce two different styles of tequila from two different production processes, the majority of which we blend together before bottling. This divergence begins at the milling stage as we crush some of our agaves in a roller mill. In this process, roasted agave is run through a series of five rollers to be broken down, after which the agave fibers are rinsed with water to release fermentable sugars, which are collected below the device. In swiftly separating juice from fiber, it contributes vegetal and citrus fruit flavors to the resultant spirit. All fermentation at Patron takes place in small wooden tanks made from pine wood planks. These have become come have become extremely rare in the tequila industry because they require meticulous cleaning after each use and must be replaced every four years. We believe wood vats provide the best sugar conversion as they have natural thermal control that protects against temperature extremes in both hot and cold seasons. Fermentation is kicked off by the addition of Patron's own proprietary, proprietary yeast string. The Tahona milled agave juice is fermented with its fibers ending up with a rich baked agave scent and taste uh, scent and taste plus pronounced earthy flavors. Roller milled agave juice is fermented without the fibers as the fibers were separated during milling. So its juice is fermented alone. This produces tequila with a crisper cooked agave flavor, again with green, vegetal and citrus notes. We use small copper pot stills because they're integral to developing Patron's signature flavors. We distill the Tahona and Roller Mill tequila separately and differently, resulting in two distinct liquids that, when combined, become Patron Silver. On the Tahona side, our stills are tiny, but industry standards, uh, they're tiny by industry standards. 700 liters for the primary distillation and 500 liters for the second. The agave juice and fibers are both included in the primary distillation. This hallmark of the Patron method produces herbaceous, earthy, baked agave flavors. On the roller mill side, our stills, stills are slightly larger, but still small for the industry. Around 2,500 liters primary, 1,500 liters secondary. The more squat shape and long neck help bring out fruitier, sweet characteristics. To produce Patron Silver, we simply blend the two resulting distillates and mellow their ABVs from still strength of 55% ABV to 40% using pure water from our deep well before bottling. For our age variants, we will fill our tequila into an array of different barrel types, where differences in wood or wood varietal and toast level offer a huge variety of additional flavors. How big a part of the Patron experience these barrels derived flavors will be will depend on how long we've left them, the tequila in the barrel. Patron Reposado, for instance, is matured for just three to five months, preserving the spirit's lively, fruity freshness. Meanwhile, Patron Añejo matures for between 12 and 15 months, and Patron Extra Añejo for over three years, blending both of these old stagger notes of stewed st stone fruit and coffee cake. So we're going to go ahead and taste through Patron Silver, uh, Reposado, and Añejo. When it comes to tasting and evaluation, I recommend starting at the chest or at your chest and slowly raising the glass towards your nose. Breathe in through your mouth and your nose at the same time. You want to be able to access flavors and aromatics simultaneously. 70% of what you taste is what you, you smell. As you raise your glass to your nose, you will notice different aromatics, usually lighter tones or more floral tones on the low end and then sweeter, more earthy aromatics closer to your nose. Once you reach to your nose, I recommend closing your eyes 
to close off one of those senses and amplify that sense of aromatics so that you can convert it to your palate. Close those eyes and rotate from nostril to nostril. Each nostril can identify different aromatics. You want to get the full atmospheric presence of anything available in what you're tasting and evaluating or smelling and evaluating. For me, Patron Silver, I get notes of black pepper, green pepper, citrus, and some nice grassy notes. What do you get? When it comes to Reposado, we want to do the same exact thing. Imagine what we got with Silver and how it's evolved. How has the barrel characteristics transformed these flavors and aromatics into a... Um, a more complex tequila. For me, I feel that some of the, the bright roasted agave notes I got on Patron Silver have been mellowed out a little bit, implying a little bit of additional sweetness, maybe a slight oxidization, but open up with grapefruit, slight notes of baking spices, and finishes with a smooth, clean roasted agave note. Moving on to Patron Añejo, product that has been aged 12 to 15 months in these five different types of barrels that we just described presents still that roasted agave that we look for with yams, hints of apricot, and marzipan, and then opens up to a, a world of baking spices with a hint of tobacco, leaf, and fruitcake. Earlier today, when we were discussing some of the more modern methods of flavor extraction, I noticed a particular expression across some of your faces. Were you still engaged? Absolutely. Was yours a look of steadfast confidence you were going to carry off the Patron Perfectionist crown? Without a doubt. No, instead, in that brief moment, I saw skepticism. Learning to use these expensive gadgets might be fine in theory, you were thinking, but there's no chance that my bar will ever lay hands on them. Well, you were seen. But what if I told you there was a way of living that of the 50 best lifestyle on a dive bar budget? We're finishing our time together today by showing you how to build your own $100 bar lab. That's right, because creativity in bartending isn't just about drinks. Sometimes it's the question of problem solving. We've created a list of ingenious hacks and cut price alternatives to that technology that the industry's top 1% don't want to share with the rest of, the, the rest of us. With new models costing anywhere from 2000 to 11000 in US dollars, and the replacement parts tricky to quickly source when they break, rotovaps can be as much as a curse as a blessing for the bars that rely on them. A simple pressure cooker with a low pressure function mimics the environment inside a rotovaps glass distillation flask. When suspended in a pan of warm water, the pressure cooker's contents boil, even though the actual temperature they're subject to is only about 45 degrees Celsius. While it's not possible to take accurate cuts from the distillate, you'll still be able to use this method to extract flavor from heat sensitive ingredients. Useful for clarifying everything from fruit juices to fat wash spirits, centrifuges spin liquids at such high speeds that the effect of the g-force causes their uh, constituent parts to separate according to their density. In, this landmark in his landmark book, Liquid Intelligence, food scientist Dave Arnold puts forward a humbler option for bartenders looking to clarify liquid ingredients. Dissolving agar-agar into a batch traps larger color molecules in a firm gel. Once the mixture is transferred into a salad spinner lined with a clean dishcloth and spun, clarified liquid flows into the bottom of the chamber for collection. As we've already discussed, cold pressed juicers are essential for extracting juice from fruits and vegetables while keeping their nutrient content and flavor intact. Looking to keep your bank balance intact too? Try chopping the ingredients you like to juice as finely as possible. Unfold a clean dishcloth and place a pile of the chopped ingredient in the center and fold the cloth to a loose parcel. Place the parcel into the basket of an elbow juicer and squeeze as you would a piece of citrus. Perhaps not the best option for a high volume venue, but a great way to test recipes before investing in a cold press juicer. 
these pieces of lab grade technology have only recently transitioned into the prep kitchen, but are already beloved at the industry's top end for their versatility, ease of use, and economical design. Their price point, however, can be anything but economical. The exact same ultrasonic technology that drives the expensive lab equipment is also present in cheap jewelry cleaning units. For the purpose of infusions, the basket design actually works better than the handle-held unit, allowing a liquid to be agitated at higher frequencies without the risk of overspill. The bubbling sous vide bath stuffed with a vac sealed ingredient bag might be a common sight in bar, key, uh, bar prep kitchens all over the world, but how essential are they? The appalling environmental impact of their re reliance on a single use plastic bag aside, the level of accuracy they offer is often unnecessary. Rare is the ingredient whose infusion absolutely needs to be happen at 51.2 degrees Celsius and can be easily mimicked. If your bar already has this equipment, I'm of course not suggesting you throw it away, but if you're not so lucky, consider this. We're finishing with our most thrifty prep pack of all. When creating reliable hot infusions, the most important factor by far is consistency of temperature. You might not realize, but your bar is already full of spots that maintain consistent temperatures that can facilitate sous vide style infusion. For robust ingredients, Requiring high temperature infusion, try throwing your reusable Ziploc bag on top of your coffee machine. More delicate, milder infusions might suit being left on the kitchen shelf or even under a low watt desk lamp. You'll, eat, you'll have an idea yourself where these spots are at your bar. And after a little trial and error, you can start building them into your prep kitchen's recipe. Just make sure you squeeze all the air out of the bags and seal them securely before you get started. And there we have it, a savings of over 98%. There's no doubt that there are advantages to using the more expensive flavor extraction technology, particularly when working in a bar handling a high volume of prep. But hopefully we've shown you that the, some of these techniques you have previously discounted are, with a little imagination, cheaply accessible. Thank you for your time today and allowing me to present Mastering the Elements, an in-depth look at unlocking vibrant flavors from natural ingredients and then expressing them through delicious Patron cocktails. I hope you feel inspired to think creatively about building flavor and how to best extract it when designing your Patron cocktail on your next menu. We hope you've learned Mastering the Elements today. We hope you'll have learned leaving Mastering the Elements today having learned three different things. That approaching drinks creation is in a structured way helps you build clarity of flavor into the final serve that different prep techniques can yield different flavors sometimes even from the same ingredient and the courtesy of the hundred dollar bar lab some of the more advanced flavor extraction techniques need only be available to the top one percent of bars you won't have to wait long patron perfectionist is live feel free to submit your entries and head back to your bars into your prep kitchens and to set to work finding the flavors that you'll need to take all the way to Mexico at the Patron Hacienda. Thank you.